Morning family. <laughs> so, so to all in-person family members and also to everyone watching online from wherever you are watching, good morning to all of you. It is good to be back in the house this morning. Last week, myself and Roxanne went away for a few days. We went. That was so beautiful. And thank you, first and foremost, for allowing us to go a few days. It was just a sense of just, you know, being able to just almost in a sense press the reset button for us. Just to also just find a little bit of solace and just getting ready for the next period, the next season of where God is taking Sweetwater's church. And there's some exciting things happening. And so I would encourage you to not miss out on any of the announcements and things that we're doing. But we went, it was so beautiful, we went to a, a small farming community, and on Sunday, literally at 8 o'clock in the morning, the church bells rang into community. And, and if you know, I was almost, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an emotional dude, because like, when I heard it, it brought back memories of how I grew up, you know, in a farming community, and always on the dot, 8 o'clock, the church bells will be ringing to almost in a sense tell you, hey, you need to get to church. So maybe we need to, uh, where's my council members? We need to maybe get a church bell, <laughs> you know? You know, it's going to clang. And then we get the five-minute warning bell. No, but all jokes aside, we have a wonderful time, and I believe that you guys had an awesome time here with Pastor Rodwin. He shared a powerful, powerful, you know, message as he launched this series, the series that we are now currently in called the Psalmist or the Psalmist Playlist. Now, here's the thing. If you love Scripture the way I love Scripture, or as much as I love Scripture, if you love to study God's Word, you might be hard-pressed on the next question that I'm about to ask you. What is your favorite book of the Bible? Now, I'll be honest with you, it's a hard one for me. It's a hard one to answer, because I might go to the Gospels, because the Gospels are so beautiful because it talks about Jesus and Jesus' ministry here on earth. It talks about the miracles. It talks about people being healed. You know, all of those incredible things in the Gospels. Or then I'm like pulled towards, you know, maybe the, the book of Acts. Because you're like, it's the early church. You know, it's the first time of revival where 3,000 people got saved. You know, you read about all of those things, even where, where Paul was preaching too long and this poor guy fell through the window and he was dead. And then Paul didn't even care. Go read it for yourself because he just went down. He just said to the guy, okay, wake up, come. And then they take him back up again because he, Paul wasn't finished. That was only his second, you know, I'm almost finished, his second conclusion of his message. But if you really, really wanted to push me for an answer, as to what is my favorite book in the Bible, I have to say, honestly, the one that I read more often, the one that I really go back to, that when I'm going through something, when there's things that are just happening, that I really go back to reflect on, is the book of Psalms. Because I love it, because it helps my heart to connect with God in a vertical kind of way. You see, just to give you a bit of a background, I don't know if Pastor Rodman spoke about this, but if you haven't heard this before, I'm sharing this, and if you had this, heard it before, maybe just a recap. But the book of Psalms is simply a collection of ancient prayers, poems, spiritual songs, and hymns used in worship to connect with God. Written over a thousand-year period of Israel's history. Think about that. We have a collection of songs, of hymns, of spiritual songs, of spiritual poems and lyrics that were written over a period of a thousand years of Israel's history. This book of Psalms was also the songbook of the early church. Maybe, and I spoke about it in the beginning about where I grew up in the church bells, and it's the same church that I grew up where. Does anybody know a hymnal? Show of hands, who knows a hymnal? Like, I'm talking now like, like Christianese now. A lot of people are like, what the heck is a hymnal? So here's the crazy part. I'm giving my age away and stuff also because I grew up in a church that, you know, was, I was a little chocolatey, you know. 
and we used to go to church, and then in the pews, they had this little, you know, where they had Bibles, and then it was like either a red book or a blue book, and it had the hymnals and all gold and all the things like that. So it's like, oh, so nice. And then the, the, the pastor or the duomeni will, will come and he's like, we're going to take, you know, we're going to sing from hymnal, you know, so-and-so. So open your books and hymnal 142. And then you're like, So that's a crazy thing, because if you understand, the hymnal is actually also Psalms. And so the crazy part is that you might not even realize it, but you were actually singing Psalms already in the church. And the beautiful thing about it is if you read Psalms, go read the first part of Psalms. Not the the, the verses, but just read, because oftentimes, majority of the Psalms were written by David. Then you get the sons of Korah that were also writing, and there's about 40 psalms, plus or minus, that there's psalms that nobody can really tie it into who is actually the author of that psalms. But if you read the psalms, especially that was dedicated from, from David's time, you'll read it, it's often in the beginning part, it will say, accompanied by a harp, by a musical instrument, because that will indicate to you that this is a song. This psalm is a song. Now get this amazing part, because I'm trying to set this up for us, where I'm going with my psalm this morning, is that a thousand years of Israel history was written in this book, almost like a hymnal, where the early church were going and singing as a family together in the book of Psalms. And so, in this new series called The Psalmist Playlist, we're going to look at a number of individual psalms and go look for yourself. The book of Psalms is actually 150 chapters. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. We're not going to be able to go through 150 chapters in the Psalmist Playlist. But what we are going to do, we're going to take an overview of some of my favorite psalms and some of your favorite psalms. And we're going to work through this, almost doing an exegesis on this, and working through this and understanding how does this still apply to my life today regards to the psalmist playlist. But before we get anywhere, can I ask, let us just pray as we prepare our hearts for this. Heavenly Father and Almighty God and King, we come before you, Lord. And as we unpack the Psalms, Lord God, I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to reveal more and more of yourself. And I pray, Lord God, Lord, that you would just reveal more and more nuggets wisdom, knowledge into the lives of your children, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. Pray, Lord God, that, Lord, your servant will decrease and you will increase. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Are you ready to, 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 to see what is one of my favorite psalms? Okay, you might not realize this, but it's... It's not, I wouldn't call it an obscure psalm, but you won't, you, sometimes we overlook this psalm. It's Psalm 13, 1 3. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Psalm 13. And I thought I'll do it in the easy way, so I've got the easy to read version for us. It should be on the screen, so follow with me. It goes as follows. How long will you forget me, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you refuse to accept me? How long must I wonder if you have forgotten me? How long must I feel the sadness in my heart? How long will my enemy win against me? Lord, my God, look at me and give me an answer. Make me feel strong again, or I will die. If that happens, my enemy will say, I beat him. He will be so happy that he won. But I trust in your faithful love, Lord. I will be happy when you save me. Then I will sing to the Lord, because he was so good to me. Oh, I love that. You might be like, oh, that's a little bit of a hard one to read in the beginning part. 
but I'll explain why this is one of my favorites. It has been said that music is the language of the soul, and for many, music has the ability to quicken your heart rate, or it can cause you to relax. It can make you feel depressed, or it can cheer you up. It can cause anxiety or relieve stress. Music affects us not just emotionally, but also spiritually. And the reason why I say this is because you have to understand when you read Psalms, that as I say this, as I unpack this for you, that it's also a song book. And you need to understand how you read this, how you interpret Psalm 13. And if you say, well, music doesn't really affect me, well, let me just say, if you listen long enough to some, some heavy metal, it will affect you. And if you listen long enough to worship music, I pray it will affect you. Because music has that way of either quickening your heart rate or relaxing it. Many of us can attest to that. When you're going through a really difficult time, and I've said it many times that how I work through situations when I'm stressed out, I just put worship music on. Because it has got this way of just relaxing you. I laughed because when we were away in that small town, I'm not going to give the name because I don't want to like give it too much, but during the, 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 the weekly days, if you can call it that, they were just playing some, some crazy music. It's almost like, like seeker-friendly music. And then I remember we got into the shop on Sunday, and then we started singing. And I'm like, why are we singing? And lo and behold, it was actually worship music that the shop was playing. But you get so inclined about the worship music that you don't even realize that you're singing along. And that's the crazy part because myself, for example, we're just starting to sing and we're like, and I don't even know what the people are thinking around us, but we were just singing and that's only when we realized, oh, it's worship music. And sometimes it has that effect on you. You know the songs of that, that of the, the words of that song. And so you just go along with it. And I pray that you would understand also Psalms, that you would get it so in you that it almost becomes second nature that you would actually sing the Psalms over your life. Psalm 13 starts with these words. How long will you forget me, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you refuse to accept me? Some translations say, how long will you hide your face from me? Yeah. I mean, those first few verses are crazy, crazy hard to understand. This is King David. Well, he wasn't a king then when he was re writing this psalm. But this is David. Remember what God said about David? A man to his own heart? Yet here is David that is saying to God, How long will you be away from me? How long must I suffer? How long must I deal with this situation? And almost in a sense, we have to read between the lines, there's arrogance also in this, because he says, Will you forget me forever? Sure. We might judge David, but let's be real for a moment. How many of us have had a conversation like that? When situations we are facing, and it feels like, no, nowhere we're going. It's, it's just always just the same thing, the same problem. I'm not going anywhere slowly. I've got this sickness. I've got this disease. I've got this poverty. I've got this financial problem. And then we say, how long? But God, I'm coming to church. I joined the life group. I read my Bible. I do two amens. Even when I don't like the pastor. I'm not talking about me. But let's be real. Many of us had that conversation. Many of us have asked God, how long must I deal with this? How long must I deal with this struggle? 
This is just too much to deal with because even David says, I will die. Literally, that's his words. I will die if you do not save me. How long will you forget me, God? How, will, how long will you ignore me? Many of us have had that how long conversation. And I would imagine that every one of us had experienced feelings of despair and being troubled in spirit, just like David. We stretched to the limit, overworked and underpaid. It seems that just one crisis after another crisis is coming, wave after wave. And it's not waves of blessing, it's wave of despair. We have loved ones that has got problems. We got teenage problems, family problems, money problems. We have problems with addiction. We struggle with health problems and pain and grief of a person that is passed on. We deal with these problems and we ask God, how long? Depression is having a field day with us. It's attacking. And let me just say this, just in case you think that it's got some limit to age. It's got no restrictions to age. I know of teenagers that's going through a crisis of tending about depression and anxiety. Yo, we don't have to go far. Roxanne was highlighting it already, talking about the, the matric exams. How many of our matriculants are going through depression, anxiety, fear about just making it? Because this is so important, because it's make or break. If I don't make it, my family is going to be judging me. My family is going to be disappointed in me. I'm going to have to repeat my trick again. I'm not finding a good job, and so I can't go to university. So all that things are just piling up. Think about how much depression when you are unemployed, going from one interview to another interview, and every time you just get a shut door. And you have to go home because, especially and say this, because I can't, because yesterday we had the men's breakfast. But how many of our men have to go through that ordeal where you have to be the provider, the man of the house, but you can't provide for your family, so you have to sit with that. You have to deal with that. How many of our women deal with problems also? Let's catch that quickly. Because we sit with situations also, even with our female generation. Because they deal with all lot of issues. And so it just piles on, and it piles on. And we ask, the, ask God, how long? How long must I deal with this? How long must I cry myself to sleep? It's not a good feeling when you feel like nobody cares. Or if that you've been forgotten and forsaken. And that all your efforts to hear from God are feeling almost in a sense useless. And I want to be honest with you, because if you read those first parts of Psalm 13, that's literally how David felt. He felt like God was not there. It's hard when you're in that space and place when it seems God is silent. Have you ever prayed? Because I pray that everybody prays. But have you ever prayed when you're in that place? Because when you're going through struggle, I know this, I know this. Sometimes I use this, I do apologize in the front already. Because when somebody goes through struggle, all we sometimes say is, just pray about it. And I'm going through this, just pray about it. But it's hard to pray about it when you're going through that struggle because you might have prayed, but it feels like it's just hitting the ceiling the whole time. It's not going further. It feels like you're having a conversation with yourself because God is not listening because He's not there. He's forgotten about me. He's forsaken me. He's gone. He's to the neighbors. He's not here. And then I'm asking for help. and I'm like, Just pray about it. But your prayer is going nowhere. See, David was asking God because he couldn't find God. He couldn't hear God. He felt like God had forgotten him. And let's be real. I want to say this. I want you to hear this from me, from my mouth to your ear. 
It's normal to feel forsaken when, it, when you feel forgotten. In all of our efforts, it seems to be useless. We talk about feeling hopeless and being filled with despair. This is what David was going through. Remember what I said? This is the same dude that defeated Goliath. This is the same guy where God says that this guy is close to my own heart. And yet here's David feeling that God has forsaken him. The NIV translation put this way in verse 2 of Psalm 13. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? And day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Now the word I want to extract out of that verse is the word wrestle. Because here's the thing that I need you to understand this morning. Whenever we feel forsaken and forgotten, that's when the wrestling match in our mind starts. The enemy knows exactly what's required to start a, a wrestling match. Let me just say this. You know, we watch, some of you guys watch WWE. Like, he, he's got the belt. The enemy's got the belt. He knows exactly how to wrestle. He has all the skills all the knowledge of a wrestling match. He even wrestled with Jesus. Remember when he was tempting Jesus? That was a wrestling match. So don't think that you are too special that you won't ever inquire to be in a wrestling match with the enemy. Because if the devil can even have a wrestling match with Jesus, how much more will he have a wrestling match with you? You just have to understand that you are in a wrestling match. And what is required to sustain and be able to get out of that wrestling match victorious. That is what is significant in this whole thing. And the whole point, the key in winning your wrestling match. The one thing I want you to extract from this is maturity and intimacy with God. If you want to survive a wrestling match with the enemy... You're going to have to be mature. You're going to have to be intimate with God. And let me explain why I say this. Because when it comes into a wrestling match, you have to know your identity in Christ. Because the enemy in a wrestling match, he doesn't come to clap you. He comes to whisper words into your mind and say, you're not good enough. God is not listening anymore. Remember what you did last year? Yesterday, remember, yeah, you coming here with your goody two shoes and your nice dress and everything like that. But I remember what you did. The pastor might not know what you did, but I know what you did. And he tells you all this, and he tells you you're not even good enough to come to church. You're not even good enough to pray, because why do you pray when nobody's listening? And then the enemy will say, "But I'm listening to you." And so we're going to have to be mature and intimate with God. Because when those voices come, you have to understand which voice is talking the truth. Because maturity means that when I read my Bible, when I understand Scripture, when I memorize Psalms, there's going to be things that are going to be talking about my identity in Christ. That even when the enemy wants to speak, I go, Whoo! hang on. That's not what God is saying. So you can park off, the bus is full, and you don't even have a ticket. Can I say that again? The bus is full, and the enemy doesn't even have a ticket. So why do you want him to come and stay in your bus? Or a quantum. Or your score score, whatever. But the scripture speaks about that God makes his home in you. So why do you want the enemy to also come and stay there? And so when the enemy starts whispering words, I have to ask you, talking about the psalmist playlist, what playlist are you listening to? Because the reality of it all is, when God starts speaking, you need to know the voice of the shepherd. Because that's what God is ultimately saying. The sheep knows my voice. 
so the sheep knows what is the difference between the enemy's voice and God's voice. When the enemy says, remember what you did yesterday? You tell the enemy, yes, I know, but I know my God has got a future for me in spite of my past. I dare you to even tell the enemy, remember what you did in heaven? You got booted out. You see, the enemy will always try to, because the, he's the, that's what the scripture speaks about. He's the father of lies. And you have to be able to be mature and intimate with God. Because intimacy, intimacy, being close to God means that you know exactly God's heart. He knows who He has called you to be. And you know that He loves you unconditionally. I heard one pastor in America use the analogy, and I want to share this. This is not part of my message, but I feel like I have to go into that line quickly before we carry on. Because talking about intimacy, and some of our parents will understand this. He, he, he spoke about this analogy and illustration about talking about being intimate as a father to his children. So he wanted to prove something. So his children was in two rooms in the house, and he was in the lounge. And so he called the, the children, but he whispered, so they could just barely hear him. And so they were like, Dad, what are you saying? Dad, Dad. And so he whispers again. doesn't shout, he whispers. I'm like, Dad. And then they start moving out of the one room, getting closer to now. They, 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 they like now getting closer. And like, Dad, Dad, what are you saying? And he like, God bless you. And so they came closer and closer until they're right by him. And so as soon as he, they were like at arm's length, he grabbed them and gave them a big hug and says, I love you. Some of you are applauding because you understand what this means. God will whisper in you, but sometimes we cannot hear it clearly because we're not intimate enough with Him. He has to be close to God because you can't have intimacy with God if you're not close with God. And so sometimes you're going to hear a whisper, that means you have to get closer. If you can't hear Him properly, it means you're a bit too far. That means you have to get closer and closer. I promise you, the closer you get to God, the greater the hug. But let's go on. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says this. We demolish arguments and every petition that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See, here's the thing. David was hungry to hear from God. He wanted God to encourage him. And he wanted God to clear the sorrow from his heart. When you start feeling like God has forsaken us or let us down, there's something we need to remember. And I've got it here to use an illustration here this morning. And I hope they have it on the screen there also. Every, does everybody first, let's get, to, let's get that foundation right first. Does everybody know what this is? Teenagers, just keep your hand on because you're going to just, you're like, what is that? It's like a foreign weapon or something. But this is like a cassette deck, cassette deck right? Can you remember? Cassette, you know, tape, a tape, basically, you know? But here's the thing about this, this cassette. It's got two sides. Side A, side B. See, here's the amazing thing about Psalms 13. It's also got two sides to that psalm. Sat A is about lament. It's about the sorrow. It's about how God feels like it's like how David feels God is just so far from him that he's forgotten about him. David knows God is there. Because otherwise he would have never said how long. He knows God is there. It's just a question of how long will God leave him alone? And then David comes to Side B of the psalm. And that is where we really, really need to get the key part of when we in a situation where we feel that we are forgotten and forsaken, that Psalm 13 then encapsulates this and brings this to a close for each and every one of us. 
understand this, although David was having these feelings of feeling alone and forsaken, deep down David knew God is still active. Whatever is happening or not happening in your life, however you feel, don't give up on God. David didn't understand what was going on, but he never gave up on God. Because he knew if God is for us, who can be against us? And I love this. It's not this in Psalms, but Isaiah actually speaks about the situations also in our life. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. You see, here's the crazy part. Despite the difficult time David was going through, he began to sing a song of joy. He started playing side B of the tape. And side B is Psalm 13 from verse 5 to 6. And it says, But I trust in your faithful love, Lord. I will be happy when you save me. Then I will sing to the Lord because he was so good to me. It was in essence as David was changing the cassette tape, now playing side B. David knew and trusted in the mercy of God. He had witnessed God's gracious dealings with the people of Israel from days of his childhood. He had experienced God's mercy and his encounter with Goliath on the battlefield. So he knew God was good. He knew God was faithful. Yes, I'm experiencing things right now. It doesn't make sense. But I know God is still faithful. I know God is still good. I know I can still have joy because God is still God. And the last time I checked, He is still on the throne. The song of David was a song of praise and rejoicing. But perhaps the sweetest songs were the ones in his heart. There's no doubt that music can lift our spirits and can help us to meditate on the Lord. You might be going through some troublesome times, but your heart can be filled with the joy of the Lord through praise and worship. No matter what you're going through, no matter how many things go wrong, We have something to be thankful for. David rejoiced in the salvation of the Lord. David couldn't give up. He wouldn't give up. Even though he was full of despair through God, or even though God was silent and he wrestled with the negative thoughts, even when the enemy wanted to tell him, give up, David didn't give up. He just played side B. As long as David stayed focused on God and not on his troubles, not on his circumstances, not singing a song of despair, but a song of joy and celebration, his focus moved from his problems to God. James encourages us in the following. James 1 verse 2 actually says this. Consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters. So it's not exclusive. Actually saying brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kinds. See, here's the thing about it. Because you read it and you're like, I don't like that verse. Because how can he say I must consider it joy when I'm going through trouble? How dare James speak like that? But you see... James is not expecting you to go like this. And I'm trying to explain something to you. When you're going through trials and troubles, when James is saying, consider it pure joy, he's not trying to say, go like this. Woohoo! I'm going through trouble! Yay! See me online? Ding, ding. James is not saying this. What James is saying with regards to that word joy, consider it confidence. Hope that God is still with you, that you are not forgotten, that you're not forsaken. So that's when James is saying, consider it joy. 
So it means that silent confidence, that even when those natural circumstances is trying to come forth, you are still confident in a hope that God will bring the breakthrough. So instead of focusing on our problems, our hurts, our troubles and disappointments, start focusing on the goodness of God. Start focusing on what He has done for you. And let me just say this, if you can't find anything to praise God this morning, to be thankful for, for, for what God has done, just thank Him that He saved your life. Because that is what David is saying, I'm thankful for the salvation of the Lord, because He has saved me. And so you might be here, and there might be troubles, there might be circumstances, and you are struggling to even play side B, because you're so focused on side A. How long, Lord? How long, Lord? How long, Lord? Can I just ask you, just turn the cassette around and just say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for saving my life. Thank you for family. Thank you for a church family. Thank you that I can worship you. Thank you that I can lift my hands and sing songs of joy. Even when things are not happening in my life, I can still lift up my voice and worship you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, because I know you're always good in my life. You've never left me. You've never forsaken me. I am not alone. Even when the enemy tells me I'm alone, I know the truth. Because why? Because your word says so. So I want the band to come up. I want them to, 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 to finish this off with a song of joy. But this morning, you have a choice. And I'm asking you, before you go home, to make that choice. Let us be in your memory banks. Side A or side B? Which side of that cassette do you want your life to be in? Yes, it means that, yes, you're going to have to sometimes, like, like David, you're going to have to speak it out. You're going to have to say, God, what's happening? Can I tell you, God doesn't judge you because you're asking. He doesn't want you to be silent. He wants you to be vocal. He wants you to ask questions. He wants you to say, hey, I'm just asking what's going on here, Lord. How long will I deal with this? That's all fine. But this morning, I want you to, to also listen to, as much as we listen to side A, to listen to side B. And so this morning, can we do that rock and roll thing? Yes, yes. Are you ready for some rock and roll? You want to do some, some, some side, side B this morning? Amen. You might have struggles. You might have, have problems. But this morning, we're going to listen to side B. You're going to walk out of these corridors, out of these doors, with side B in your heart. Are you ready, church? Let's stand and let's worship. I want you to sing with a loud voice. Make some space. Let's go for the church. <laughs> 